B.F. Skinner came to Harvard as a faculty member at the same time that I came to Harvard as a student. And uh, so I got to see sort of from the worm's eye view uh, what Skinner was like and what his ideas were like, particularly because I became interested in and ultimately married his first Harvard graduate student. Well, that was Ruth, yes. Ruth, yes. So, uh, yes, it had an impact on me. I found it very easy and very appropriate to say, well, that's what psychology should not be doing. <laughs> from there we can start to figure out what psychology should be doing. But you're quite happy to take a disparate point of view. Oh, yes. I was happy and I also sort of intuitively knew that I had hold of something that was new to psychology and important. And I saw it as being an extension of what psychology ought to be about. And by the time I got through writing the theory of decision making, I was totally convinced of that and uh, had enough people around me who were convinced also that uh, I never had any worries about that. At the time that these responses started really coming in, I was with the Air Force because I had been fired at Johns Hopkins. I don't know whether you knew that. I have a vague recollection you told me once. Well, that, that must have been very difficult for a young man. Yeah, I, uh, it was an unfortunate event. The person who fired me was Clifford T. Morgan, who was the chair of the department and the big shot at Todd Hopkins at the time. He was a big shot altogether, wasn't he, in psychology? Yeah, he was. And uh, Cliff Morgan discovered, correctly, that I wasn't really all that turned on by teaching social psychology, which they had hired me thinking I would do. Now, why you would hire somebody from the experimental psychology department at Harvard <laughs> when it had a social psychology department, uh, or something that amounted to that, social relations, they called it. Oh, I uh, see. Social relations, right. Yes. And uh, why you would hire somebody thinking he was going to teach social psychology and from the experimental psychology department, I don't quite know. Mainly, I think, because nobody saw this domain that I was working in as being a substantive domain that you could organize teaching around. I might have seen that, but I really cared much more about experimentation than I did about teaching. Cliff correctly perceived that, and he got fed up with me being late to class, and uh, generally I wasn't doing well at the teaching side of the teaching and research combination. So uh, they decided they would not uh, promote me from assistant, from instructor to assistant professor, which was the promotion I needed, and keep me on. Instead, they would uh, wave goodbye to me and uh, whatever might happen, well, good luck for it. That was the most fortunate thing that ever happened to me. Uh, I'm sure you didn't know that the day you got your notice that you were not <laughs> going to get tenure. But. No, I did not. But the reason why I was fortunate was that I became aware, rather abruptly, of the real problems that the laboratory was trying to solve such as, for example, troubleshooting strategies 
And uh, so I tried to fit in, I tried to make myself useful. And uh, very quickly I found that I was really uh, the only person who was looking at the intellectual side of the problems that AFBTRC faced. The, uh, by the intellectual, I mean, you have to think about the problem of what to do next and choose sensibly. And uh, there's a lot at stake in your getting it right. But you weren't put off then by having to deal with real world problems. I was charmed by having to deal with real world problems. I'd wanted to do that for ages. Hmm. So this is the beginning of your lifelong interest in doing things that are going to have some kind of impact. Well, no, not the or beginning. Or relevant. It was not the beginning of that by any means, because that's been with me all my life. Hmm. After all, I grew up in Washington, D.C. and was fascinated to uh, listen to the talk of the seniors, senior economists who were friends of my father's. And uh, that kind of conversation was very typically about what they wanted to do if they only knew how to do it. They had the access, they had the money, but they didn't have the tools. And your father was less interested in the theoretical foundations of economics than he was in actually using these ideas? Right. Well, he, he wasn't interested in using those ideas either. His field was different in a trust. Mm -hmm. But uh, my father was always interested in having an impact. The PTRC got into political trouble. Oh, of what sort? Well, uh, it was a part of the Air Training Command, and the general commanding the Air Training Command, for personal reasons, didn't like Art Mountain or his works. Um, so, Art concluded that the only way to save the organization was to leave. He was offered a um, professorship in Michigan and in taking that he was also allowed to bring one person from his organization. Oh him. dear, and he had to choose then. And he had to choose and guess whom he chose. Right. <laughs> so uh, so in 1958, off I went to Michigan, where I had no faculty role at all. I was, uh, except that I could teach a course of my own choosing, my own devising. And you, you know the course, you took it. <laughs> That's right. Well, how, how was this made possible? I mean, uh, did uh, Art bring money with him then? Oh yes, he did. Uh, brought money and uh, there there were military funds around, and by this time I was pretty good at uh, adapting what I was see saying and doing to whatever the sponsorship requirements were. So. Uh, off we went. When was this? What year? 58. Uh-huh. When I started teaching a decision course, I, I, by that time I had invented the phrase behavioral decision theory. I don't now recall whether that's what the course was called, but that's what it was about. Yes. And that was a very successful course, not so much because I taught it or anything like that, but rather because the ideas were clearly relevant to psychology 
and were not available anywhere else. Furthermore, I had some research funds. That meant that I could do one thing that you really have to do, and that is employ graduate students. Right. So, which you did. You actually had quite a few by the time I got there in 1960. Uh, Paul uh, Slovic and Sarah Lichtenstein were both there then. Right, and uh, you mentioned Gordon. Um, and I, as it turns out, I had had other impacts as well. In particular, I had impressed a brand new assistant professor at the University of Colorado, Cameron Peterson. And Cam Peterson arrived more or less simultaneously with you, if I recall. I think he was about two years later, actually, about 1962. Okay. Because the first year I was there, you were down in Huron Street in that house. Yes. And that, that was in uh, the engineering psychology laboratory. But That's right. How did that, how did that come into being? Well, that was Art Melton's name which I was quite content with, for uh, him and me. It really didn't amount to more than that, but that was a fair amount because we both had research funds. Sure. Um, and eventually it was the device that it was used to get me into the Michigan faculty and uh, get me into the psychology department. That I was told, and correctly told, that what I had to do was to make a place for myself by making a place for my field, which I did. Well, that was a pretty strong motivation to make the thing. So you were intellectually committed, but you also had uh, to I deliver. Had. That's correct. And there never was a problem. The ideas flowed smoothly, freely, easily. The uh, research, there was always something to do. Well, there was never any shortage of ideas. Never either. any shortage of ideas, never any shortage of people who saw this as an interesting area in which to have ideas. I had met Jimmy Savage. Uh, because, yeah, the, what, we're, what I'm coming to is that I had a major hand in trying to get uh, Jimmy to come to Michigan, which we succeeded in doing. He was at Chicago before that. I had met Jimmy while he was at Chicago because I was sent a copy of his book, uh, Foundations of Statistics, to review for contemporary psychology. And uh, I expressed the most un un uninhibited enthusiasm for the book, saying if I were on a desert island uh, and could take only one book with me, that's the one to take. And uh, if on return I had uh, opportunity to talk to somebody about what's been going on in my absence, my first question would be, has Jimmy Savage written a book yet? Another book. <laughs> right. So, uh... Which sadly he never did do, did he? So he and I became acquainted, and when the time came uh, to, for the statistics department at Michigan, to try to uh, lure him to, to Michigan, I had a hand in it. How on earth did they ever do that? At that time, Bayesian statistics was... Not exactly the most popular approach to statistics around. Uh, there must well, have been some progressive thinkers in the statistics department. I misstated it because it wasn't the statistics department because there wasn't one. Oh, I see. Uh, it was the mathematics department. Uh huh. And uh, that. I don't know why that makes it easier, but it clearly did. Well, it meant, meant there were no statisticians, co uh, classical statisticians, to oppose it. That's right. So, uh, Jimmy came. And in due course, I asked Harold Lindman to write a 
paper for the seminar that uh, he and you and others were in. Um, uh, actually, I, I never took a course from Jimmy Savage. No, no, I didn't say that. Oh, oh, this was the seminar. This is my seminar. Oh, your seminar, that's it. The one that Harold wrote the paper for. Ah, uh, right, yes. And uh, I uh, felt that there were, I read the paper, felt there were some things left out and so on. I showed it to Jimmy. And he said, Ward, why don't you and I do this right? And I enthusiastically said yes. And that started a long period in which he and I met at least once a week, and in which I wrote uh, what I understood of uh, what, he, what we'd done the previous week. The net result of this was uh, um, very long paper which had impact both in uh, statistics and in psychology. So uh, he saw Edward Simon Savage as a way of saying, well, here's how you use this stuff. I see. And I did too. And I, furthermore, what I knew, I think, in a way more poignantly than he did, is that in using this stuff, you're going to be interfering with uh, half a hundred folk ways of the uh, data gathering profession. <laughs> yes, indeed. And he, he was willing to do that. He, thought that those folk ways should indeed be interfered with. And so we set out to do exactly what, in fact, the article did do. Can, can you tell me something about what your interaction must have been like? I know that um, you would have enjoyed, I, I suspect you would have enjoyed getting what he was saying in that book to a simpler level so that those of us whose mathematics is less than brilliant could understand it. Was that part of your motivation or was oh, it yes, also to bring it to, to psychologists? Both, both of those and, and more because I assumed and was correct in assuming that uh, though it was going to be in a psychological journal and for psychologists it would be paid attention to by others. Mm -hmm. I never had any idea of how much attention would be paid. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've had three blockbuster articles in my lifetime. Uh, the original Theory of Decision Making article, the uh, annual review chapter in the 61 mm -hmm. uh, Behavioral Decision Theory, and Edward Zimmerman and Savage. But in the meantime, of course, the Bayesian um, paradigm had influenced us. I had arrived at, in 1960 already to uh, be your research assistant, and we engaged in that experiment that in <laughs> involved four hypotheses and 12 sorts of data <laughs> in which conservatism was discovered. Yes. I, I can still remember plotting plot after plot after plot and the astonishing thing to me was that this experiment, which had been done with Bill Hayes, uh, had really been intended to explore whether or not people pay attention to prior probabilities, because that was all the debate about, mm -hmm. about Bayesian statistics. And I can real, still remember one day you came up to my office and I had all these plots stuck up on big boards, and I said, look, Ward, they are paying attention to the prior probabilities. And you looked at the plots for the 15 pieces of data after that, and you said, yeah, but they're not doing very much afterwards. <laughs> and that sticks out firmly in my mind as the day that conservatism was born. I hadn't seen that. We had so focused. I was so focused on the prior probabilities that you were the one actually who saw the failure to revise.
mm -hmm. in light of new information. You remember that? Yes, I do. Well, why did you think that? I mean, what what was your? Well, then immediately it was just a comment about some data, but. Later the same day, if I recall correctly, certainly later the same week, I started thinking more about the meaning of uh, that finding and concluded that uh, in the first place it was a big finding, a big effect, as it is a big effect, but in the second place that uh, the meaning of it was even bigger mm -hmm. because the question of how much juice you get out of data uh, is really very important. Uh, if, you can, if you're going to spend money on data, you ought to have some idea of what you're buying. I can't answer the question of how I thought it up, but I certainly did. And I think uh, I probably was the first one to propose exactly the idea that came to be known as PIP. Uh, that idea still makes sense and still has uh, domains from which it would make sense to use it. The uh, basic thought is very simple, namely that uh, if you've got an information processing system, it has really two tasks to, to do. One of them is to gather and display and present information, and the other one is to uh, express uh, opinions or decisions or some form of output that is based on this information. And I recall visiting with you, I believe, uh, a NORAD commands uh, location and seeing a huge uh, room full of information summary and display devices and with a uh, balcony where the commanders and the demigods of this world were supposed to be sitting when the system was in operation. And in that whole place, I looked hard and for and didn't find an output. That's right. I remember it well. So uh, I went to the local officer who was taking us around and asked him, uh, where's the output device for, for this system? And he pointed to me, uh, pointed out to me, a telephone at the front of that balcony, and said, "That's it." It was bright red, I remember. <laughs> yes, and it was a very ordinary telephone. <laughs> yes, it was. The uh, admittedly, the decisions to be taken in that place uh, justify enormous amounts of seriousness in assembling the information. But do you really believe that the input to output ratio of an information processing system should be like that? I don't. <laughs> I suppose it depends on whether you count the billions of nerve cells. <laughs> <laughs> well, so uh, I had been aware of this issue before, but uh, as the 1960s wore on, I became more aware of it and more concerned about it. And the obvious question is, if you're going to process the information, what are you going to use to uh, do it with? Well, I knew an answer to that. Uh, indeed, we all do. It's called Bayes' Theorem. Uh, so the idea occurred to me that a sensible way to uh, devise an information processing system might be to have human beings judge the diagnostic meaning 
of the data, the impact, the likelihood ratio, uh, or let ratios, and uh, then have a computer do the aggregating via Bayes. That idea I called PIP, and I contrasted it with the performance of at least three other systems, namely PEP, which is uh, posterior probability, uh, POP is posterior probabilities, PEP is what? Personal processing. Yes, I think it was pers... I don't remember, maybe it was personal estimation? Yeah, something personal, was uh, Yeah, I forget. <laughs> PIP, POP, and PEP, that's right. That's right, and POP. And POP, oh yes. That was a, an abbreviated version of PIP, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right, it was a little one. <laughs> uh, at any rate, the idea was to compare uh, these various different kinds of w ways of designing systems with one another and to attempt to show uh, that the Bayesian one worked better if indeed it did. It's an interesting idea because it turns what we were assuming as a scientific application of Bayes on its head. In a scientific application of Bayes we always had difficulties, or scientists felt they had difficulties at determining a prior distribution because after all they were doing experiments on something that was new so there wouldn't be very good data available. But then you collect data and then you use some sort of standard statistical process like a Bernoulli process to determine the probabilities so that the determination of the probabilities in light of data was automatic. You're saying no. The, in the absence of a data generating process, we should use the people to determine the likelihoods and perhaps the priors can be determined on the basis of a mass of a prior data. So, this, In any this, case, the, how the priors are determined doesn't matter very much because they're, they're prior. Yeah, they'll, well, they'll also be swamped yeah. out, hopefully. They'll be swamped out by the data as soon as the system is up and running. Well, particularly if you're going to take serious decisions like launching missiles on the basis of that. That's right. Uh, I, I can't quite think that the Human Performance Center at Michigan was the house that Pip built, but... <laughs> Could be. It certainly had something to do with it. In fact, this is the uh, first time you've mentioned the Human Performance Center. How did it... Um, we'll pick up the Pip story in a minute, but as long as this is in our minds, how, how did the Engineering Psychology Lab somehow transmogrify into the Human Performance Center? Well. Art Melton wanted to build a human performance center, asked me to help, and I said, great, let's do it. The crucial step in doing this was to lure Paul Fitz away from his uh, professorship at Ohio State and bring him to Michigan. And we worked on that, and we did. At any rate... Well, it was uh, really the four of you, wasn't it? I mean, I think uh, Bill Hayes. Bill was Hayes in was involved as well. That's yes, that's right. That's correct. The one person who was not involved and whom I wish had been is Spike Tanner. Yes, indeed. Uh, Spike was a, shall we say, a fellow traveler and a friend, but uh, he never came to be interested in being on the main campus, which is where all this was. Uh, Dave Krantz joined us, and Amos was involved, and. Well, Danny was there too, Danny, Danny Kahneman, was, because... Danny uh, Kahneman came there as postdoc, and it was as a result of uh, that common, that uh, uh, organization that Danny and Amos met. I don't, I believe that they met in my class, but I'm not sure. Hmm. Uh, in any case, so it was a very, very uh, distinguished group and a very pleasant place to work. Well, shall we go back to Pip? Yes, indeed. Let's, let's uh, pick up the story now. Well, the uh, 
late sixties were a good time for Pip. The data indicated that uh, it did just what I would expect it to do, namely it would reach firmer opinions earlier uh, on the basis of the same evidence uh, in almost any circumstance you could you could think of. I mean, it was tried in many different ways and in many different laboratories eventually. Uh, and it always worked. It, it, indeed it would, you know. Uh, there's a special name for PIP in, uh, in the UK. Among the medical fraternity they call it Idiot Bays. And they call it this because there's no we, d we hadn't at the time anticipated a hierarchy where you might have unreliable data and then had to make an inference about some intermediate but not directly observable thing which in turn had a probabilistic relationship to the hypothesis. So that became hierarchical phase but that was also recognized uh, by your team because I remember eventually Cam Peterson uh, edited a, a special journal That's right. uh, edition of, uh, of, of what we then called Bayesian hierarchical systems, and now would be known as Bayesian nets. Well, they would be Bayesian nets. They, they are would indeed. use the arithmetic of Bayesian nets. That's also very interesting that I rarely see in any reference to Bayesian nets that I think it was about 1968 that issue came out, late 60s at any rate. Very rarely referenced. It appears to have not come to the attention of the artificial intelligence community or to those really who were developing Bayesian networks subsequently or influence diagrams. Well, as they, they, they a few of them know about it and a few of them have in fact cited it, but they don't make a big story out of it and I don't see why they should. Mm -hmm. They've, their focus is on how to do the arithmetic properly. Oh, I see. And how to set the, how to, first of all, how to represent the structure but then how to do the arithmetic properly within that representation. Was it true, though, that our, your original interest in this arose because of the thought that maybe conservatism is about the fact that people don't trust the data, and therefore they actually have a hierarchical system in their heads, and we all know that once data are unreliable, then, of course, inferences are more gentle and less uh, extreme. Was that the... Was that the origin, do you think, of the thinking about? I don't think so. I think the origin was more simply that uh, it's obvious that there are these hierarchical uh, inference structures. You encounter them every day. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can't think about inference very long without recognizing that you have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but uh, walk before you run let's get the uh, one-stage inference right before you start worrying about the two-stage inference. Sure. So the simple PIP system was, in a way, the precursor for what would be now called a Bayesian net. Right. That's exactly correct. And any of the tasks that you want to do now, you do with the tools that solve Bayesian nets. Right. That's one of the fortunate accidents, unbelievable accidents, of my life. I was in my office at Michigan, phone rang, and the gentleman at the other end uh, introduced himself as a New York millionaire who had an opportunity to by a casino, wanted to use it as a laboratory in which to do research on gambling, uh, mainly for tax reasons, and wondered if I thought that was a good idea and if I would be interested in being involved in such research. I uh, took, had some difficulty in picking myself up off the floor with that introduction. I can but imagine. As, I managed to whisper a yes, yes, yes into the phone, and in due course I found myself in New York uh, in the offices of Charles B.G. Murphy and uh, trying to 
get acquainted with some of his uh, acquaintances among the ranks of senior psychologists and uh, to answer his question. Um, I think the one thing that perhaps most characterized the difference between me and the other psychologists attending that meeting is that I walked into it with a written uh, paper, written memorandum saying, here are the studies I would like to try to start with. And uh, Mr. Murphy loaned the uh, Poor Queens Corporation a uh, some some number of millions of dollars, I don't know how many, uh, with my access to the resulting casino as an unwritten but explicit condition of law. I was told that I would need to get myself approved of by the Gaming Commission of the state and that I should therefore go and have lunch with the head of the commission who happened to be in town. <laughs> I did. And uh, I couldn't believe the conversation because he showed familiarity with my research. No kidding. Yes. That's uh, astonishing. A man named Wayne Pearson. And uh, later I checked up on him and found out that he had gotten his bachelor's at the University of Nevada, his master's at the University of Nevada in psychology both, his PhD at Cornell. No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that his thesis had been on the psychology of gambling and that he had read everything I had ever written. Amazing. Just the most fantastic luck you could imagine. I'll see. Wayne Pearson was very helpful uh, then and later on. It all went through as planned and as scheduled and we had experiments running. Uh, as soon as Callahan had satisfied himself that the process was not going to uh, interfere with his gambling operations. Well, this was a special room set aside, wasn't it? No. no? Uh, just a special area. Oh, an area, right. Yeah. And, and But only one person at a time could play? Uh, well, only one person could play at a time, but uh, others could watch and did. We advertised it as being the best odds in Las Vegas, which of course was true. We arranged things so that uh, here either the expected value of the game was zero or that the expected value of the game was zero with best play. And uh, in any case, either way, that's the best odds in Las Vegas. Sure. So. Uh, we kept that research going, that uh, research setting going, and uh, hired our own uh, dealer, John Ponticello, and uh, learned, I think, some interesting things. Like what? Well, the I think the most interesting thing that I learned from all this is that uh, stakes make less difference than I thought they would. Uh, that is the absolute level of stakes. Uh, people pay attention to the differences. They pay attention to the structure of the gambles. But uh, they'll sort of, a, at least in Las Vegas, will sort of adapt to the stakes they encounter. Uh, I also came to be very clear that my original 
conclusion from my thesis experiments, which was that people prefer to gamble at some probabilities other, rather than others, uh, showed up very clearly in the Las Vegas results. In particular, people like 50-50 bets. But I seem to remember, too, that you wrote that uh, since there were at least a couple publications that came out of that. Oh, yes. And, and I remember one of them said that uh, the expected value model itself did so well it was hard to improve on it, not even expected utility. It made much difference, that's correct. Yeah. So what, what doesn't that suggest that in simple situations, because these were all two outcome bets, weren't they? Yes. In simple situations, people actually can behave quite Rationally. Quite recently, yeah, I yeah. agree. I've always believed that, and that certainly uh, is how I would interpret the results of the Las Vegas program. I should perhaps mention that it wasn't just me. The other people ran research in Las Vegas as well, including uh, Paul Slovic and Sarah Lichtenstein, Amos Tversky, uh, Dave Krantz, and uh, everything that I did, I couldn't have done except for Barb Goodman. Uh, so uh, this worked out, I thought, is a very interesting exploration of somewhat unconventional kinds of research. <laughs>